the, it's certainly interesting that there are structures on Mars that appear to be artificial. We can't know. Uh, I mean, I've seen examples here on planet Earth where two geologists disagree on a rock structure in front of them, so whether it's man-made or natural. John Goody, some yeah. geologists think it's natural, some geologists think it's man-made. Uh, so, you know, if you can get different differences of opinion amongst professionals on an object that you can actually touch, uh, how much more complicated it is where you're dealing with photographs sent back by NASA from the planet Mars. I felt it was worthy of investigation. My uh, part of that book uh, concentrated entirely on cosmic cataclysms and on the cat cataclysmic history of Mars, the fact that Mars has at some point been stripped of half of its outer crust and clearly has suffered a, a, a major cosmic event. I was interested in that and it's part of the background that led me to Magicians of the Gods because when I started hearing the news of the comet impact, uh, when that first entered the scientific press in 2007, I was already prepped because of the work I'd done on the Mars mystery to understand how dangerous uh, comets actually can be, sure. and, the, and, and, and the, the devastating effects that they can have when they strike a planet. We, we, we need to get there and, and f find out what's, what's going on. I mean, I just think that there are so many mysteries that humanity needs to be inquiring into. Uh, it's very unfortunate that we divert so much of our energies to warfare, you know, and hatred and fear and suspicion, and we're always ready to raise the budgets for the latest weapon of mass destruction, but, but actually to explore the mystery of existence, which includes exploring our immediate cosmic environment, and also journeying within. We, we need to explore the mysteries of human consciousness as well. Very little of this is being, is being done, and, and that gives me the sense that our culture has somewhat lost its way. This is, the, this is the problem. The whole adventure of the exploration of space is being cast in the material terms that our culture loves so much, that sure. here are planets that we are going to exploit. I mean, we've already exploited this one and done so much damage to it and disrespected this fabulous gift that the universe gave us. Uh, the danger is that as we go to Mars and the Moon and other parts of the solar system, that we're just going to be exploiting them. We're going to be treating them as dead matter that we're going to mine for our economic advantage. And that would be most unfortunate. Exporting it, uh, exporting it around the, around the universe as, as it's already been exported uh, around the world. These are, these are issues that we're going to have to pay attention to. It seems to me that humanity is at a turning point. Uh, we need a major shift in consciousness if we are to continue to function on this planet sure. and not destroy ourselves utterly. Mm. We need that shift in consciousness and when that shift in consciousness comes, then our whole attitude to the exploration of our cosmic environment will change and it will become a spiritual adventure, not uh, a, an economic enterprise. Yeah. Uh, and that's fundamentally what it is. Finding out who we are is a spiritual adventure and we need to, to, to make sacred again those inquiries rather than reduce everything to economic imperative. Well, certainly, and I've been, I've been logging on to the internet sites with, uh, with images of the faith, of course, and, and uh, also looking at the British press who have, uh, who have reacted in, in exactly the same way, um, which, is, which is to look at the medium resolution uh, image that came out first and to say, well, this absolutely proves that uh, that there's nothing of interest in terms of artificial structures on Mars. I mean, there, there, there seems to me, certainly in the press in Britain, I can't speak for the American press because I haven't seen it, to have been an incredibly hasty and almost relieved reaction uh, <laughs> along the lines of, oh yes, all those Mars people were just pranks after all, and now NASA has proved it so we can all rest quietly and forget about it. And I think that this is... I think this is a huge and, and, and extraordinary pity uh, that, that, that the issue should be taken that way. We're engaged in a, in a seminal event here. This is the first time mm -hmm. that we have ever really explored a neighboring world, at least the first time in our memory as a species. And to allow ourselves to be deflected from a very intriguing aspect of that uh, exploration and to allow ourselves to uh, to feel that there's nothing there, nothing there further to look for uh, in terms of signs of intelligence 
is, I think, extremely sad on the basis of this image. Quite frankly, the image is ambiguous. It's extremely ambiguous, and I always felt that it would be. Those comets are masses of ice binding together huge quantities of their rocky, icy masses flying through the heavens. They can be as much as 300 kilometers in diameter. Uh, and because the rocky elements are bound together by ice, they have a tendency to break into fragments. And those fragments can be very large. You can have six kilometer wide fragments of solid rock uh, breaking off from from, from, a, from a comet. And a anybody who was around in 1994 and watching television will remember Shoemaker Levy 9, the comet that broke into more than 20 fragments, all of which plowed into Jupiter with the planet Jupiter with devastating uh, e effects. So, you know, this is, this is uh, what we're looking at. We're looking at four pieces at least of a very large comet, pieces in the range of a mile in diameter, that hit the North American ice cap. 12,800 years ago, we were still in the ice age. There was an ice cap two miles deep covering North America, everywhere north of New York. Uh, and, and that's where the primary impacts were. And that's why, until quite recently, we've had impact proxies, uh, nano diamonds, carbon spherules, melt glass, the characteristic products of a high impact uh, high energy impact uh, distributed across a large part of the world's surface. But now we're also starting to find the remnant craters. Of course, there are not massive craters because the craters were excavated in ice and sure. the ice melted away. But the shock effects on the ground underneath in the northeastern part of North America are now very visible. So this has gone beyond the uh, level of being a proposal. Uh, this is solid documented science. We had an extinction level cataclysm 12,800 years ago. It changed everything and it hasn't yet been taken into account by historians and archaeologists in their models of the origins of civilization. I think those who support the, uh, the position of artificiality at, uh, at Sidonia have definitely been dealt a, a grievous blow by this photograph. I think it's up to them now uh, to sustain their position. And it has to be remembered, and it's a very important point, that the uh, face structure, whatever it is, whether it's a hill or whether it's uh, actually some kind of face, is set in a context, and that context is very large, surrounded by a lot of other structures. And I think that NASA must, and I, I believe they or hope they will, uh, photograph those other structures on the coming two passes that are going to be made over that area. And I think that really what's needed to get to grips with this issue is to look in detail at photographs taken from a variety of different angles, not only of the face, but also of the presence of other structures that are found all around it. And I think it would be really premature and silly, and in fact I feel further stupid of us, <laughs> to write off this aspect of the Mars mystery uh, simply on the basis of one photograph. We aren't in a much better position now than we were in 1976, and I think that more images are needed before anybody comes to a conclusion. But you know what? At the end of the day, this question of images of things is never going to settle the matter. The only thing that's really going to settle the matter, and, and uh, most people who've been researching in this field have said this from the beginning, the only thing that's really going to settle this matter is a man landing on Mars. I can give you an example of why I think that, and that concerns um, another disputed structure this time on Earth. And that disputed structure is so-called underwater monument at uh, Yonaguni in Japan. Now, I'm, I, I dive, I scuba dive, and I've dived to that monument more than a dozen times. I've dived at that monument with two geologists uh, on two separate occasions, and, I, and subsequently I've put those two geologists together to discuss the monument in a room. Now, one of the geologists was Professor Robert Schock from Boston University, um, who, uh, as you know, um, is a very open-minded man and is extremely open to the idea uh, of an earlier sphinx. In fact, he's been he's provided the basic geological work that has raised the whole issue over the age of the sphinx at uh, Giza. And I thought it would be a very good idea for him to have a look at this underwater monument in Japan. And quite frankly, after six dives to the to the monument, shocks. Uh, in, impression, although he feels that it definitely merits further research, a great deal of further research, his instinctual impression is that somehow this, this extraordinary thing is natural. Now, I have also dived there with Professor Masaki Kimura from Okinawa University, who's made more than 100 dives to the monument. Kimura is uh, also a geologist.
and uh, he is convinced that it's artificial. So we have here an enormous structure, it's about 500 feet long and 60 feet high, uh, which has been seen and physically touched by two highly qualified geologists and they both reach different opinions about it. Now, if that happens, you know, with ground truth, actually when you're face to face with the object itself, if we can get that level of disagreement over, over such an object that we can actually see and touch, you can imagine um, how difficult it is to reach a rational and informed judgment on the face on Mars simply from a photo. This is not a war for um, some petty scientific definition. This is a war for the question of what we are and what our place is yes. in the universe. Yes. It's a war of paradigm between a view that sees us as the center of creation with nothing else outside us and uh, a view that sees the universe as filled with life. Uh, there's, a, there's a fundamental issue in society here which is underlined by this debate and it's inevitable, uh, since the stakes are so high, uh, since the stakes are our own understanding of what we are, it's inevitable that that war, unfortunately, should be fairly bloody with neither side taking any prisoners. And, and uh, as they say, and have said for a long time, the first casualty of war is the truth. We live in a rather dangerous cosmic environment. The, the Earth is uh, surrounded by flying objects called asteroids and, and, and comets. Uh, sure. We pass through the debris stream of a fragmented giant comet twice a year. It's called the Torrid Meteor Shower. I'm speaking to you in late October, and we are already passing through the Torrid Meteor Stream at the moment. The Torrid Meteor Stream is the remnant. It's the debris field of a giant comet spread out along the whole orbit uh, of that comet. That's the comet that hit bits of which hit the Earth 12,800 years ago. And astronomical calculations indicate that some large bits of that comet are still in orbit in the Torrid Meteor Stream and do pose a real and present danger to civilization on Earth. If we were hit by objects on the scale that hit the Earth 12,800 years ago, our civilization definitely would not survive. Humanity would survive, but this complex interlinked technological culture would not, would, would not survive. So what I'm saying is, not doom and gloom, not the end of the world is nigh. I'm misrepresented if people suggest I'm saying that. What I'm saying is, let's pay attention to our cosmic environment. Instead of spending billions on warfare and weapons <clears throat> of mass destruction that simply further divide us from one another, let's put together a grand collective project of mankind to sweep our immediate cosmic environment clear of large objects that can bring about the end of civilization on Earth. We do not have to be the next lost civilization. We should be paying attention to this. It's irresponsible of us not to do so. The universe has given us a precious gift, this beautiful planet, and the incredible opportunity to be born and to live a life in a human body. We should not turn our background on threats to this amazing garden that we live in. We, should, we have the technology to do something about it, all it takes is the will. We sure. need to take our eye off the wars and the mass destruction, and we need to put it on to creating a safe cosmic environment for the Earth and for the future generations of humanity. Blind, horrific violence of which our species is so careful, and because it has led us to be closed-minded and, and, and blind, uh, it, it, it causes us to ignore the danger that confronts us and it causes us to ignore the advice and the warnings of the ancients on this matter. It's as though we've just deliberately cut off our entire heritage as a species beyond the last uh, two or three thousand years when things have been written down. Everything before that is just considered to be uh, irrelevant to us. And yet what we have there is the accumulated advice of our ancestors who undoubtedly experienced cataclysmic events before, particularly at the end of the last ice age. And because of the state of mind that we're plunged in today, we're ignoring that. And if we continue to ignore it, I'm convinced that we're going to pay a terrible price and that uh, in the language of ancient mythology, that the gods will once again punish us for our arrogance and our cruelty. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced. That, uh, that such a message uh, has been passed down to us, not just in a single hall of record, but in an entire network of monuments all around the world, which are linked to mythology and linked to astronomy. And using the tools of, of astronomy and an open-minded consideration of mythology and of the nature of the monument, uh, there is an enormous amount of information that has been very carefully encoded and deliberately passed down to us by our ancestors. But we have to take a step 
in order to benefit from that information, we have to be prepared to listen to what they have to say. And right now, we're not. A team of around about 30 uh, very highly credentialed earth scientists, uh, geologists, people who study, the, study isotopes, people who study the ocean, but very highly qualified people. Nobody's in any doubt about their credentials. Um, and, and they have been publishing in the heat of the peer-reviewed press uh, for almost a decade now, since, since 2007. Every year presenting more and more new evidence that can only be interpreted one way, that there was a gigantic series of cosmic impacts very recently, 12,800 years ago, on a scale similar to the impact that destroyed the dinosaurs. It was slightly different in the way that it that it fell through, but but the scale is roughly similar. We're looking at an extinction level event, and this is and this is documented by clear um, chemical and mineral traces uh, in in the soil. There's really a huge amount of evidence in support of this. Now, do all scientists accept? That evidence? No, they don't. There's a there's a serious dispute about it. Every single paper that's been published by the team, for example, in the Journal of Geology or the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, has been attacked, and attempts have been made to refute it. And on every single occasion, the team have refuted those refutations. And so the the dialogue goes on. Right now, it's it's very clear. And I don't think anybody is arguing that something really bad happened to the Earth between 12,800 years ago and 11,600 years ago. And uh, what I've tried to show in Magicians of the Gods, and I've considered the criticisms too, is that the, the overwhelming weight of the evidence supports the view that we are dealing with a giant comet, perhaps 100 kilometers in diameter originally, that broke up into multiple fragments. Some of those fragments hit the Earth 12,800 years ago. There were further impacts 11,600 years ago. It looks like there were related impacts coming out of that same debris stream uh, in the Bronze Age. The most recent impact um, was the Tunguska event in 1908, because that debris stream is something we know about. It's called the, the torrid meteor stream. It is the frag fragmented debris of a former single huge object. Uh, and, and there are many large objects still in the torrid meteor stream, such as Comet Enki, which is a fragment of the original comet, uh, Olgiato, Rudniki, uh, uh, other objects in the range of one to five kilometers in diameter, any one of which could would have catastrophic effects if it were to collide with the Earth today. And calculations show many more objects uh, in that meteor stream. And the problem is the Earth crosses that stream twice a year. So in a strange kind of way, we we are engaged with and connected to the problems that our ancestors faced 12 and a half thousand years ago. We, we have not escaped from that. The business of that comet with us is not yet done. Um, and, and uh, you know, all of this requires, requires, I think, a new approach to the past. Because if we can really, if we can really understand what happened 12,800 years ago, right in the foundations of history, two things are definitely going to happen. One is that we are, as I said at the beginning, going to have to think again about everything we've been taught about the origins of civilization, because the models in schools and universities for the origins of civilization do not take account of an extinction level cataclysm right in the foundations of, uh, of history. Uh, and secondly, we're going to have much better information uh, about the predicament of our planet today. Uh, and what risks we face from the torrid meteor stream, and indeed from other uh, potential impactors uh, out there in the in the cosmos. I don't want to spread gloom and doom. I don't want to tell a scare story. I just think it's important that we don't stick our heads in the sand. We we are looking at a danger which need not be the end of anything. We are perfectly capable of solving this problem. It, it's long overdue, as a matter of fact, that, that some of our technology and some of our colossal treasure should be spent on sweeping the cosmic environment of the Earth clean and making it safe for future generations. It's foolish and irresponsible not to do that. Uh, and, and if we understand clearly what happened 12,800 years ago, I think it will provide us with the incentive to do that, and I hope it will do so in time. The, the story of Mars is just the most 
mysterious story in the solar system. And uh, it tells us so much about ourselves and our predicament on this planet. Uh, before the year 2030, uh, it's the fragment of a giant comet. This is what the whole book that I've done on Mars is really mm. focusing on. It's the fragment of a giant comet. The astronomy behind this is absolutely 100% sound. The top academics and what the... You see, a comet in itself is a relatively... Uh, to, for a comet, a full comet, to hit the Earth is uh, something that doesn't easily happen. But what people don't understand is that when these comets fragment, and when you have a giant comet, which is 400 kilometers across, God. fragmenting, then these fragments spread out along the whole of the orbit of the original comet, and they create a much uh, bigger target uh, for the Earth to collide with. Have a 30 kilometer fragment of comet on an Earth-crossing orbit, which will hit us before the year 2030, unless we do something. Earth scientists are looking at the fingerprints in the ground of a gigantic cosmic cataclysm of the nano diamonds of the trinitite that's like melt glass that's the sort of melt glass that you get in nuclear explosions evidence of of temperatures across huge areas of the earth's surface in excess of the boiling point of quartz that's 2200 degrees centigrade um, you know we are we are we are looking at a at a very very massive uh, and 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 serious problem here the Earth scientists are producing hard evidence of a giant cataclysm 12,800 years ago, a cataclysm that was associated with massive flooding. The primary impacts of those comet fragments were on the North American ice cap. This was the ice age. That ice cap was still the best part of a mile and a half, perhaps two miles deep. Okay, and the colossal heat and kinetic energy released by these impacts caused tumultuous floods to pour down across, for example, the, the, the channel scablands of, of Washington State in the, in the United States, uh, and also into the, into the world's oceans, raising sea levels very, very rapidly. So suddenly it isn't just a kind of whimsical curiosity that there are more than 2,000 flood myths all around the world, of which the best known, of course, is the flood of Noah, uh, in the in the Bible, this ceases to be, you know, just a curiosity of mythology, and suddenly we really have to ask ourselves: Are we looking at eyewitness reports mm -hmm. of what happened 12,800 years ago, when something so bad occurred that it seemed to those who lived through it like the end of the world, and it did not extinguish all human life? Uh, it's pretty clear that the human species went through a bottleneck uh, at this time, but that, but certainly there were survivors. And I believe that those survivors were of both types, both the hunter-gatherers uh, and peoples from advanced civilization. And I think that those survivors from the lost advanced civilization set about trying to recreate what they had lost. They set about trying to recreate the, what is referred to in the texts as the former world of the gods. Um, it had been stripped away from them, d d destroyed, but their, their project was to restart it. And in, and in seeking to restart it, the obvious place to go was to settle down amongst the hunter-gatherers who had also survived. In fact, it's quite likely that the hunter-gatherers of, of that time uh, had a better prospect of surviving the cataclysm than civilized peoples, as would be the case today. I mean, if we were to be struck by multiple fragments of a giant comet today, um, I very much doubt that Western technological society would make it through. I think it would not. It, it's a very fragile society. It depends on interconnected specialisms, um, and, and um, the, the bonds that tie it together are, are, are weak, actually. We look strong, but that's only on the large scale, when you get down into detail, you find that everything is very fragile and nobody knows how to survive. No, I mean, very few people have a faintest clue, but who does know how to survive are the hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari or the Amazon rainforest. They know how to survive and, 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 and such a disaster might leave them relatively untouched. So I would suggest that it was amongst hunter-gatherers during the Ice Age that the survivors of the lost civilization settled taking nurture and sustenance from them, but also seeking to transfer to them some of the knowledge that they had as an advanced civilization. And that's why the other intriguing development at the moment is the discovery of archaeological sites that don't make any sense in terms of the existing model of history. And of these, by far the most important is the site called Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, 
which is a series of gigantic megalithic stone circles. Looks a bit like Stonehenge in a way, but it's about 50 times bigger than Stonehenge and 7,000 years older than Stonehenge. And whereas there's a background to Stonehenge, there's no background to Gobekli Tepe at all. Bang, right there in what is now southeastern Turkey in an area inhabited at the time entirely by hunter-gatherers with no agriculture whatsoever, suddenly appears a gigantic, sophisticated, very complicated megalithic site which could only have been created by people who already had experience of, of architecture, of cutting and moving stone, of organizing a building site and, and, and so on and so forth. And at the same moment that this extraordinary megalithic site appears, suddenly agriculture starts to disseminate in Turkey. The techniques of agriculture suddenly appear. They hadn't been present there at all. And, you know, I talked to the late Klaus Schmidt, who, Professor Dr. Klaus Schmidt, who was the excavator of Gobekli Tepe, and he put forward an idea that I thought was very interesting. Without, he did not want to buy into the lost civilization hypothesis at all. But looking at Gobekli Tepe, for him, what he sees it, what he sees it as, is as a center of innovation. Um, it's it's a place where new kinds of ideas spread out around Turkey and. I think that's exactly what it was, and I think that center of innovation was set up by the survivors of the lost civilization. So what we're seeing around Gobekli Tepe is not the sudden precocious invention uh, of megalithic architecture and all the skills to go with it by a hunter-gatherer of people who'd never done anything like that before, and at the same time the invention of agriculture. No, it's a transfer of technology from the survivors of a lost civilization to the hunter-gatherers who they had taken refuge uh, um, amongst. And, and when we take this into account with the date that Gobekli Tepe is founded 11,600 years ago, well, that's precisely the date of the second spike of cataclysm, uh, 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And it's also the date that Plato gives us for the destruction and submergence of the lost civilization of Atlantis. He says that happened 9,000 years before the time of the Greek lawmaker Solon. Solon lived in 600 BC. Therefore, Plato is telling us that the submergence of Atlantis by huge floods and, and earthquakes in a single terrible day and night took place in our calendar in 9,600 BC, which is 11,600 years ago, which lo and behold, turns out to be the date of the foundation of Gobekli Tepe. I would strongly suggest by survivors of that lost civilization, which may never have called itself Atlantis, but nonetheless is Atlantis by any other name.